Matthew 27. Tonight we're going we're gonna to discuss some, uh, what, well it's all interesting to me, but one of the more interesting things that the Bible records that, um, I don't know, I'm sure you may or may not be aware of and uh, some of the things that God records for us, but we don't have all the answers. Remember in context, we're looking at the point where Jesus has been uh, convicted, he's been nailed to the cross, and we're looking at the 32 different steps from the time he was convicted to the time he's sealed in the tomb. And uh, we really are at stage 10, but I'm not really going to go on to stage 11 tonight because on Sunday mornings, I'm in a series right now entitled Heart Cries from the Cross. Again, you can go to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page and you can find them. Um, and really that series covers stage 11 all the way to stage 25. And so I really don't want to cover them here and on Sunday morning. So if you really want to know all that, uh, tune in and we will get there. I, I will remind us, though, as we start tonight, uh, that when Jesus died, we discussed, you know, who killed Jesus or who took his life. You may remember when we decided who took Jesus' life. Nobody did. <laughs> you know, the Bible is clear that Jesus said he yielded up his spirit, that Jesus died when Jesus chose to die and not a second before. And God gave up his life uh, because he loves you and me. Now, I, I, a lot of times um, I get from non-believers, atheists, those who would mock our faith, something along this line. You ever, you ever heard this? Um, that, you know, it really wasn't that big of a deal because after all, if Jesus is God, then he's not really, you know, he's not really going to die, you know, so he knows he's going to come back. So it's really, you know, they, they minimize that. And on the one hand, yeah, he is God. And when it comes to the death and the crucifixion of Christ, it really wasn't until um, I went through life of Messiah and saw some of this from a, not only a Jewish perspective, but also from a looking at it very analytically and theologically, uh, that I had some of my own personal questions answered. Um, for example, um, the, the one of the sayings, matter of fact, the middle saying of the seven sayings from the cross is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there's a lot of debate about what Jesus was saying there. And we have to be reminded, and Dr. Frutenbaum lays this out really, really excellently, that Remember that Jesus, was Jesus 100% God? He was. Was he 100% man? He was. Now, to get my brain around that, above my pay grade. You know, it just is. The Bible teaches that. Uh, we see it all through the Old Testament. Messiah had to be a man. He also had to be God. And Jesus is the God-man. And, and understand when it, came to, when it came to Christ dying on the cross... Jesus died so you and I wouldn't have to, and why did God have to come and take on, take on the form of a man? Because it was man, it was Adam and Eve, it was us who sinned against God, right? Did God need to die because of God did something wrong? Did God himself have a problem? No, it was a man problem. And so when Jesus died on the cross, understand that when he his death there, he was in his humanity side and his divine side was never separated from God. So when he was saying, my, my God, my God, why, thou, why hast thou forsaken me? Some people think that at that moment, somehow the Trinity was split. I would argue to you, theologically, is there any way that God can divide himself if he is one? He cannot. You, you can play all the circles you want. God can't die and God cannot be separated from himself. So then what, what's the point? Well, in his humanity, living the perfect life that you and I could not live, he became that sinless representative whose death was substitutionary and satisfying for God in terms of his holy demands. And, and so his humanity from the uh, sixth hour to the ninth hour, those three hours, he was separated from God. And I, now you might think that's not a big deal. And the reason we don't think that's a big deal is because we are all sinners born separated from God. And once we get saved and we are now our spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us, but we still live in this flesh, don't we? Which still always is alienating us from the spirit filled life, right? It's always the battle every day. But imagine Jesus Christ never sinned. His divine side was never out of fellowship with God. 
and his human side was never out of fellowship with God. In other words, if you could be the perfect Christian without, a, without any sin and always enjoy, even from a humanity standpoint, that relationship with God, understand that relationship was cut there on the cross. And when you read, my God, my God, why has so forsaken me, you really have to understand that from the fact that Jesus is just not saying idle words there. Not that he ever said idle words, but that was a quote, right? It's a quote from Psalm 22. So if you really want to understand what he was saying there, you've got to go to Psalm 22. And if you'll study Psalm 22, and in one of my sermons, we're going to deal a little with this, you'll find out that in Psalm 22, the, it's a picture of the Messiah who's crying out to God for help. And do you think that God the Father is going to respond to God the Son when he cries out? Yeah, he is. You see, when he's crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he is separated from God, his spiritual side. He's experienced literally spiritual death. Because spiritual death is separation from God, isn't it? That is really a definition of death. And so Christ was on the cross there and he's spiritually separated. And at that moment, Jesus is now in a judicial relationship with God, that he has become our sin, the sin of the world, and God is the righteous father is judging that sin. But as Christ cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, a messianic cry for help, we know, because uh, the Bible tells us when he says this on that ninth hour, that, that his, he is answered, and that is why the very last thing that Jesus says of his seven sayings is, Father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And that, that human relationship with God now has been restored. He's now back in a paternal relationship with God. And so the, 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 the picture that is being painted there is that spiritual resurrection always precedes physical resurrection. I, don't, I know I might, might, I hope I'm not getting too deep on you here tonight. Um, I don't, I don't mean to, but I, I, I we're going to cover some of this on our Sunday morning, but you know, Sunday morning, I stay not quite as deep uh, as I do with, on Wednesday night. Um, but in you and I's case, can you ever experience a resurrection unto life apart from first receiving Christ as your savior? You have to deal with your spiritual standing and when I trust Christ as my personal Savior, my spirit is, is, is redeemed and my whole body is, but I still live in this flesh. But I'm not, I have not yet, and none of us in here tonight have fully experienced uh, our fully fixed bodies, have we? <laughs> Me and Howard and DT are poster children for that. We, we have not. But because I know that Jesus rose from the dead, just as he first experienced spiritual, he was, like you and I, spiritually alienated, then God answered his prayer, was judicially satisfied, brought Jesus back into the right relationship. So you and I, through the blood of Christ, are once alienated, dead spiritually, but now we are restored to a paternal relationship with God. And once we have that spiritual relationship with God, you can mark it down that one day, <laughs> your old broken body going to get fixed. I, you know, I don't know when, but it's going to happen. And, and so it, there's a lot of theological significance in the stages that I really haven't covered. And maybe I, maybe I should go back on a Wednesday night because I know some of the things I've just said might be new information to many of you. Um, I would just play back the tape and uh, think about these things. If you have a question, you know, send me a line or uh, send Pastor Danny. Ask Pastor Danny. I was like, he used to ask me all the questions. And I say, ask Pastor Danny. He'll, he'll explain it to you. But it, 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 it never made sense to me until I really understood the dual nature of God and why Christ had to be the God man because um, he died for you and for me um, but all that to being said when Jesus died and yielded up his spirit we know some unusual things happened some amazing things happened TV's got nothing really on the Bible and I don't know you know why necessarily God chose to include this in the scripture but he did and in my way of thinking if God put it in the scripture well he wants us to know it, right? He wants us to do something with it. So I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 27 and beginning at verse number 51. All right. Um, matter of fact, I'll start in verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So he yielded up his spirit. And behold, verse 51, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. 
and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now, is this some amazing stuff here? You know, maybe some of you, maybe you're not familiar if you're watching this online, or maybe you've not studied this enough to know that the moment when Jesus died, a bunch of crazy things happened. Now, crazy things were happening, when I say crazy, some unusual things, even before he died, while he was on the cross. Anybody remember something? We're going to get this in one of my sermon series, too. Uh, you remember uh, from, if you study Christ on the cross, we know he was on the cross six hours. And basically, the first three hours from the ninth hour till, you know, the, or the, the twelfth to the third hour, from twelve to three, he was on there, he suffered uh, the wrath of man. And then from, we know that that last three hours, he suffered the wrath of God. And that's when he experienced spiritual separation. We also know that during that time, there was darkness that came, remember? And you remember in the Old Testament, when Moses was getting the people out of Israel, you know, out of slavery, and you remember the story of the 10 plagues? Y'all know that? And the last plague was what? The death of the firstborn, and that's where you have Passover, where God said you need to put the blood on the doorposts. Does anybody remember what plague happened right before the 10th one? The ninth one. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, <laughs> man, I got some smart people here. Um, darkness. Now, we're going to study that. Matter of fact, our, our Good Friday service is coming up here quick. I don't know, Brother Will, are you going to be able to cook something for us that night again and the, 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 for the Good Friday service? Are you planning? Well, yeah, I like all the, the, the Harriset sauce and all this stuff. We kind of do a replica of the, of the Lord's Supper, the 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 one he observed with his disciples. And then we usually eat something, a traditional, not the whole meal. Will only makes a, a taste taste amount. Although usually Will makes so much that usually there's stuff to go home afterwards. But he usually tries to find some kind of Jewish Passover-ish kind of meal that they might have eaten and give you just a sample of what that would taste like. So that's on Good Friday free promo. Anyway, back to where we're at. All these things happen. Why do you think God records this? pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? I mean, any reason? Why do you think, why is it, why is it in the Bible? All right, he wants us to know about, well, why, then why does he want us to know about it? What do you think, what's its significance? All right, I think, you know, I mean, Jesus died. I, I think when, when God, God's son, God in the flesh died, the whole earth literally groaned. And I think it was a, these are signs that, that God was sending to demonstrate that Jesus was who he said he was. That this was no ordinary death, and it was not. Now, there's basically three of these things that happen. You have the earth quaking and rocks breaking. You have the tombs opening and the dead coming out. And then you have the veil that is torn. Now, I want to go through really quickly because we're going to have a mission, so we're going to help drive in ministries here in a few minutes. But I want to go through these three things and kind of look at them for a little bit, okay? But I want to look at them maybe in reverse order. Well, I guess it's not. The first one that's recorded there is the, the, the veil of the temple. In verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, uh, to, from the top to the bottom. And what this is referring to is inside the, the holy place, which was a uh, you had a building that was a rectangular basically in shape, and this would have been the second temple or commonly referred to as Herod's temple because King Herod had poured lots of money into making this temple quite beautiful. But there was the holy place was the first room, and then the second room was called the Holy of Holies. And uh, you know that from the Old Testament. And separating these two rooms was a veil, a curtain. And we have pretty good idea from the dimensions of Herod's temple and pretty good idea that the, the veil uh, in rabbinic writing refers to this was 30 feet wide. So when you think 30 feet, understand our platform here is about 40 feet across. So, you know, from that wall all the way to about where the piano is or so, imagine it that wide and 60 feet tall. Now, our ceiling is maybe, what, 30 feet, Mike? Maybe you think it's about 30 foot up there, something like that. So think of a curtain that's twice as high as our ceiling in here and 30 foot wide and about, the, the, the rabbi said, about the, the width of a palm of a man's hand. 
So depending on how big of a man it is, four to five inches thick. You know how much that joker would weigh? Just the weight of it? So sometimes people have this idea that there's this curtain there and maybe somebody came up and ripped it. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't even think those guys that do the world's strongest man competition, I don't think they're tearing that. Um, they're not ripping it. Now, we're also told very specifically, and Mark records this as well in his gospel, that it was ripped from the top to the bottom. Now, why is that significant? Yeah, you know anybody, you know any 60 foot men or, you know, I don't know if they put up a ladder real quick. I don't know. You're not going to climb up on 60 feet. The point was understanding that God did it, that God tore it from the top down. Now, this is really significant. And one of the verses I'll use to demonstrate that is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. We are told that the, the veil is a representation of the body of Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ in his physical body. And you see, when you think about Mosaic law that was, in, that was there until Jesus' death, as long as Mosaic law was in force, when you look all these thousands a year, when it came to access into the Holy of Holies, only one man of one family, of one tribe, of one race, of one nation, once a year could enter into that room. Think about that. Say that again, because that was profound. One man of one family, of one tribe, of one race, of one nation, and only one time a year could that man enter into the holy place. And that was on, anybody remember when, when did that happen and who was that man? In the Old Testament, what man went into the Holy of Holies once a year? The high priest. And when did he do it? The Day of Atonement. Remember that? Um, the Day of Atonement, they would, uh, that's when they would go anoint the mercy seat. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a big deal that one, one guy. Now, once Jesus died, and specifically, it's the death of Messiah. Now, we understand the resurrection had many significant theological truths for us and practical truths. But specifically, his death, that's when the Mosaic Law became inoperative. That it no longer, as Colossians teaches, and Paul writes a lot about this, that it was the death of Messiah that accomplished this. But once the law was rendered inoperative, God's presence through Messiah was now available to all. In other words, when the veil was torn, was the veil still there? Yeah. It just, instead of being one piece now, uh, you know, it was, it was torn, and there was now a gap that somebody could do part this and you could enter in there. And, and so the writer of Hebrews says, so you and I as believers come to our relationship with God through the veil. Are you following me? If the veil is Christ, then when you and I get saved, we understand the only way for me to get to God is through Christ, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I know there's a lot of religions out there say, can't we all get along and all roads lead to God? No, there's only one road that leads to heaven. All the rest of them lead to hell. And I know people, oh, that's intolerant. No, it's truth. And, and so tonight I want you to consider when Jesus died and these things happened, it was God painting these pictures for us saying, just when that veil tore, and I can only imagine the panic the complete panic on the, on the high priests and the priests of the temple compound there when this happened. This must have been, oh man, I, I, it, there, there is no rabbinic writing on it though, and I'll talk about that in a moment why I think that is. I think there's a real reasonable explanation for that. Uh, they didn't want to get that out there. They were probably trying to patch it up really quick. They probably got their needle point out. I don't know if they, you know, crochet, you know, let's, then they started at the bottom, worked their way at the top from man's approach. And so today, you either access God through Jesus Christ, or you're like those priests that are trying to sew it shut and say, no, there's another way, i.e. man's way, i.e. the way to hell. And so uh, this is a very clear picture when this happened was very, very significant. Now, uh, notice after the veil is rent, it tells us also that the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So you've got this earthquake going on. I, don't, I have never been in a significant earthquake. Anybody in here been in a, been a Karen, you have, where, where'd you, where? In 1964, that's when I was born. That's probably why it happened. <laughs> the Lord said, one of, my, one of my under shepherds is coming. Shake up Alaska. Um, really? You know, that's, that was a, I can say that's a few years ago because I'm not a spring chicken. Uh, and yet you still remember. 
Um, wow, the strongest earthquake that's ever hit the North American continent, and Karen was there. I am so glad that you were safe um, all these years. Anybody else experienced an earthquake, been that earthquake? Mike, you've never in all your travels, no earthquake experience? Just minor ones? I haven't even felt minor ones. All I know is if you had a big one, like Karen's talking about, I... I think that would leave a mark on me. Would that leave a mark? On me? It always, it would, to me, it reminds us how little we really are. We can build all these super highways, super bridges, and Mother Nature can destroy them in moments, right? And, and so I think God sends this message here, but it gets even more, if they were afraid with the earthquakes, notice what else it says. And then, the, the, the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and then went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So what Dr. Frutenbaum thinks, and this makes sense to me, that when you had the earth shaking and the rocks breaking, you have these rocks splitting and the graves opening and the dead saints came forth. So the walking dead has nothing on the scriptures except the scriptures are true and it's a much different walking person. Um... Let me say, first off, when you read this kind of thing, I think the first thing that comes to our Western mind is, can you imagine one of the, set of the cemeteries here in around Prattville, all of a sudden people starting to come out of those graves? How would they have to do that? They'd have to crawl up through six foot of ground, right? That'd be kind of creepy, wouldn't it? I, I, that's not what, what is happening here. Uh, most of the guys think, especially the Greek word that talks about that the graves, the tombs were open. Remember how Jesus was put into a tomb and they rolled a stone, and it was like a cutout cave. Those were very common in that day. And when the rocks break, I think what it was talking about is those rocks that were sealers on those tombs, those rocks broke. So it wasn't like somebody's going out of the ground. I don't think God would do it that way, although if it scare a, a sinner straight to God, maybe that would have been a good thing. I don't know. Um, maybe we ought to try that, right? Um, but I think it was more these tombs that were sealed, the rocks broke. And then it's interesting, uh, Dr. Frutenbaum thinks that, that the rocks broke when Jesus died. But then three days later, and by the way, see Pastor Danny's channel if you want to talk about how many days, think Jewish, it really wasn't three, 24 hours in my humble opinion. And I think in a scriptural context, it wasn't what we would consider three 24-hour Gentile days. Um, but that's another sermon. See Pastor Danny, C4C Apologetics. He'll explain it to you. But at any rate, there's several hours, you know, that when Jesus was there in those tombs that did fulfill, by the way, three days and three nights from the Jewish uh, perspective. Um, but bottom line is, at his resurrection, after Jesus rose, then these people came out. Can you imagine going to the funeral that of the cemetery where your loved one and after this earthquake and people are saying, oh, this broke and that broke. So you run down to the, you run down there and you, you realize that your loved one, the big rock that's sealing him is broke. Now you're a little panicked on that, right? Because what are you going to do? Now everybody needs new stones. You can't just go down to Stones R Us or, you know, Home Depot. I don't think they had that. This, so they were going to be that way for a little while until they could really get them fixed. Well, then can you imagine after Jesus' resurrection, who I believe is the first fruits from the dead, that all of a sudden these, it says saints. No unbelievers were raised, only believers, only saints. But can you imagine being at, you know, Sunday afternoon dinner, starting to hear the, the, the run up around town that Jesus has risen from the dead and news is, I bet it was spreading like wildfire. Hey, he, he's not in the grave. Hey, no, they can't find him. You know, I imagine it was all beginning to hit Jerusalem. Where's, where is this guy who was once dead? And then there's a knock on the door and you open the door and there's your, there's your mom or your dad or your granny and grandpa standing there. I'd be there. <laughs> he says, I'd be joining him with that thing. How, I think about how in the world would you respond? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, I, I say, people say, well, you just throw that in there. You know, if, if I was trying to pass off a, a fake writing, I would not put things like this in there. And the fact that it's in there, and you don't find this, this kind of stuff all over in the scriptures, but here it is, and I just thought to myself, can you imagine if they showed up after they'd been dead? Now, what do you think they'd have to say? I bet they did most of the talking at the dinner table, huh? Now, there's a lot of debate, and we don't really have a whole lot of other information. The Bible pretty much just says this right here in Matthew's account. Says it. 
says it happened and never mentions it really. Maybe indirectly, Paul might mention it indirectly, but we, really this is it. So, I, you know, you can't, I don't want to go too far and take too much, but there's, here's one of the big questions that remains. If these people came out of the grave and now they're alive again, what happened to them? Where'd they go? Now, there's two schools of thought. Dr. Frutenbaum holds to the first thought. I probably really hold, I probably disagree with him, but only slightly. It's no big deal. Uh, but one thought Dr. Frutenbaum would hold is that these people were like others that Jesus had brought back from the dead, like Lazarus. Remember? Called out Lazarus. He was in a grave clothes. He came out, same kind of thing. He came out of a tomb. They, they rolled the stone away, and here he comes out. They unwound him, and most people that believe Lazarus lived out the rest of his natural days, and he died again. And one view is that these people were resurrected from the dead, and they lived out whatever life they may have had, and they died again. Now, my thought is, what if, what if Granny and Grampy that, that were rose from the dead died when they were 88, 95? You know, they don't, how much natural life do they have? <laughs> they might be going, I'll be going back now. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. The other view, and the one that I would personally probably hold, is that when Jesus rose from the dead, did he physically rise from the dead? Yes, he did. Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead. But when he rose, he was physical. You could touch him. He could eat. The, the Bible's clear about this. But he also had what we call a glorified body, right? Now, be careful when people talk about glorified bodies and they say, well, they're going to be able to walk through walls and all this kind of stuff. I don't know because Jesus is still God and you and I are not. But I will say this. When you and I, who are believers, the Bible tells us, whether at the rapture of the church or years down the road when we're dead and buried and the trumpet sounds and he returns and the dead in Christ rise first, one day, if you're a believer, you're going to come out of that grave, right? Physically. But you are not going to be the old broken you that you are now. You are going to be perfected and have a glorified body. Now, I don't know the full extent, even totally. There's a lot of debate on what the glorified body will, will or will not have to it, but it'll be a lot superior to the one we have now. And some people think, just as Jesus rose with his glorified body, and the scripture says that these people did not come out till after his resurrection, that they came out of the grave like he came out of the grave in their glorified body. And that later on, in a matter of days, weeks, or maybe, maybe they stayed here the whole time that Jesus stayed here after his resurrection, and or somewhere around the same time that Jesus ascended into another dimension, that they do the same, and that they went back into, into glory. And those are the same views. One of the reasons I like that view is not only because it comes after, but also when those believers died, the Old Testament believers, where did they go? I want to be very careful in your answer. All right? I'm going to, this is a trick question. So, They went to paradise, also called Abraham's bosom, also called Sheol. Um, Sheol had two compartments. They had the side, paradise side, and then it had the side of the torment side. And that's why, you know, Lazarus, the rich man, could see Lazarus over there in the other, other chasm. And I personally, there's debate on this, but I personally believe when Jesus uh, was dead for those days, that time, Ephesians says he went down and led captivity captive, and he emptied out the paradise side and took those people and put his blood there on the, on the spiritual altar, the altar of the temple, the heavenly temple there, and, and made access to what now we consider heaven and took those people from there to there. But even paradise was probably a pretty cool place, don't you think? Now let me ask you a question. And I know tonight most of us in this room, not all of us, we have some young people here. Glad to have young people in here. Um, yeah, Whitney, you're still young. I know you don't feel it right now. And Holly, you know, you don't feel it. Um, but would you rather live in paradise or would you rather live in this broken world in your broken body? All the old people are going out, sign me up for paradise. Now, if the Lord said, now, I don't know what happened. Now, maybe he went down after when he died. And he was down there in paradise taking people back to heaven, you know. And he, but he called a few saints out alongside and said, hey, you're going to have a little detour before you go up to heaven where all these folks are going. I, I got a little job for you. 
Now, what are you going to tell the Lord? No, you ain't going to do it. And besides that, how many of us wouldn't say, the Lord says, hey, I want you to go. You're, you're gonna, I'm going to give you a physical resurrection for this time, and then I'm going to bring you on into glory. I want you to go into Jerusalem, into the holy city, and I want you to witness of what's happened. Go say hi to your family. That, you know, wouldn't that be awesome? And then I personally believe that after they, they ascended into heaven, they went and met with all the people who currently, when you and I die now, we go into a place called heaven. Which, by the way, is that our final destination? Mm -mm. Remember? All right, we're going to have the millennial kingdom here, and then there's Revelation 21 and 22 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. I think one point in time, all, we all are going to be back on this place, except it's going to be perfect. I can't wait for that day. So many Christians think heaven is going to be boring and eternal life is going to be just, I don't know, floating around like, I don't know what they think. But I can't wait till the time where you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ live in a perfect world where I never sin against you and you never sin against me. I never offend you. You never offend me. And we sit and we scheme about things and we develop things and we build things to the glory of God and we live in eternity in the presence of God. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Who wouldn't want that? I don't know. But this is a cool event here, isn't it? And I, again, I, wouldn't, I don't want to give any of this stuff to you too dogmatically, all right? I'm just throwing out to you what, my, what I personally think, what Dr. Frutenbaum teaches. Um, all I know is that was, it was pretty cool. I, I would say that, um, as Leviticus 23 talks about, in the fulfillment of first fruits, that these people were a demonstration of that as a picture of what you and I would eventually do. Um, but I also think after Jesus' resurrection and then his ascension and you get into Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost, you find that the church goes from a handful of scared men who are meeting, hiding up in, a, in an upper room with a couple of women, running about like scared little men, and then all of a sudden these scared little men become these brazen preachers of God. And Jewish people, Orthodox Jewish people, which has never been seen in Orthodox Judaism ever before and ever since, thousands of them are now becoming followers of Christ. How do you explain that? Yes, the resurrection of Christ, but could it be that that day at Pentecost was slightly energized by a bunch of people that said, you're not going to believe this, but Aunt, or Mama, Nana, whoever she is, Granny, Grammy, Grampy, he, they came up out of the grave, came and visited us for a few days, telling us that all this stuff that Jesus said is the true thing, and there's, there's this place called heaven, and I don't care what they do to me. They can kill me, and we know the early church took a lot of death, didn't they? I'll tell you one thing. If you and I were as certain of heaven as they might have been at that time, would you be afraid of dying? Now, the reality is, by faith, we have a record of what happened, and we should have that kind of faith, but God forgive us. That's why it's, it's interesting in verse 54, and I'll stop here for tonight. Um, it says, now, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus <laughs> saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Even those hard Roman soldiers knew this was not any ordinary death. And history says, church tradition says, many of those Roman soldiers became followers of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons that Christianity branched off into the Gentile world, into the Roman world so quickly. Uh, I don't know, it, but it certainly makes sense to me. All I can tell you is these events had a lot of impact. The living dead. Interesting stuff, isn't it? I hope I give you a, I give you a lot to think about tonight, um, and I hope something you can uh, chew on. Now, I will leave you with this in my closing illustration. Again, one of the reasons I love I love uh, studying underneath Dr. Frutenbaum at Life of uh, at Ariel uh, org. If you want to look at that ministry, uh, Ariel org, is Dr. Frutenbaum does a lot of recording rabbinic writings. He references them, gives them to you. And it is interesting that while they don't mention really the tearing of the veil, which doesn't, isn't really unexpected because that's not something they would have wanted to broadcast. Uh, tradition says they fixed the, the veil and it stayed there. However, in their own writings, it is very, very curious, very, very interesting, very, very intriguing to me that they go out of their way to, to date the year 
they got a way to recognize that something strange happened in A.D. 30, which is the year that Dr. Frutenbaum and I personally believe is the year that Jesus actually died. I think he actually, by our dating system, was born 3 B.C. 3 and then died A.D. 30. That, that's the dating system I personally subscribe to. And one of the reasons it, I'd it'd be strengthened in that view is that the rabbinic writings of the first century notate that a lot of strange things began to happen or did happen in A.D. 30. Um, and one of them is called the legend, and it's written in the Talmud, tractate, if you want to know what it is, Yama, tractate 6, uh, section 3. A uh, quote, It has been taught 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the western lights went out. Now, the western light refers to the center lamp of the menorah standing in the, in the holy place, that first room in the temple, there was the menorah there and the light in the middle. It, it, kept getting, it kept going out. They always kept that lit as a constant reminder of the presence of God. And after AD 30, it kept going out mysteriously. They'd come in and it would be out. They'd relight it, come back in, it'd be out. It was so troubling that the rabbis recorded it. And it happened after Jesus' death. Uh, another one is called the legend of, it's written by both Josephus and recorded in the Talmud, is that, I personally believe when the Bible talks here about the earthquakes and the earth shaking, the, the rabbis record that the doors on the temple. Now understand, these are not doors like these here. If you remember the veil, I told you how big it was. Imagine solid, really thick wooden doors of that kind of magnitude. It, it took several men to open one door. That's why it took the Romans so long to get into the temple compound and the, into the temple itself in AD 70. But they wrote in their thing that in AD 30, for some reason, the doors swung open, both doors, by themselves. They came to the temple and all of a sudden the doors are wide open, which the rabbis took as a demonstration that God had departed from them. And many of the rabbis wrote how they wept greatly, but they didn't know why. Here's a third one that the, the lintel of the temple doorway, that the big stone on top of where these doors were, that it cracked. I guess the stone must have been huge in its size. And they record that in AD 30, and one of the early church fathers, Jerome, mentions uh, this happening in AD 30. Uh, the last one I'll give you, and then we'll be done, is um, uh, the legend was called Azazel. Now, Azazel is a Hebrew word that literally means removal, and it was something that Leviticus and the Old Testament law, Leviticus chapter 16, uh, prescribed as a, something they did on the Day of Atonement, which I've already mentioned when the high priest would go in there and put the blood. Well, where did he get that blood? Well, Leviticus says that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to get two goats. And you bring these two goats and you cast lots. One of the goats is going to die. One of the goats gets to go away. And they'd cast lots and the goat, the goat that would die... Um, and that goat was literally called, or the, excuse me, the one that got away was called the Azazel. But the high priest would take that, that the goat that was by, chosen by Lot, they viewed God picked this one to die. They would take it to the, the base of the altar where the burnt offerings were done. They would slit its throat, pour out the blood on that altar. Then they would take a portion of that blood and they would take that blood into the Holy of Holies and that was the blood that was put on there to be the satisfaction for the sins of the whole people for that year. Well, then when he came back out, he would take that other goat. That was the goat that had been determined to live. And he would put his hand on the head of that goat, which was a, a, an identification with that goat. And he would confess all the sins of the people on that goat. That goat became the sin bearer. And then they would chase that goat away out into the wilderness. The, the picture that they're trying to convey here is that by the shedding of the blood of the first goat meant that the second goat could carry away the sins of Israel. Isn't that profound? By the death and the shedding of the blood of the first one gave the ability to the other goat to take the sins away. And it's the work of Christ. Now, the amazing thing is in the Talmud is that According to the legend of Azazel, when they sent that goat, the one that was alive that carried away the sins of the people, one of the things they would do is they would tie a red ribbon around 
the horn of that goat. And the red ribbon symbolized the shedding of blood that allowed that goat to be able to be the one that could take the sin away. And the legend had it, and several rabbinic writers mention this and say it occurred. They said that when they would send that goat away, as it was going, that red ribbon would turn white. And if they didn't see it, they'd send out people trying to find that goat just to make sure they wouldn't do mess with it. But they just want to make sure that the, the ribbon turned white. Because that meant that their sins, as Isaiah said, though they be red like scarlet or crimson like scarlet, they shall be what? White as wool. And when they saw that it turned white, they knew that God had accepted the sacrifice and their sins had been removed from them. But the rabbis record that in AD 70, the red ribbon did not turn white. And the rabbis were greatly troubled. Now you and I know why, because Mosaic law was now inoperative and the blood of goats was no longer significant and capable of taking away sin. And so that is not the method of getting forgiveness of sin. Now that sacrifice is Christ himself. Brock? Yes, I'm sorry, what did I say? 70, yes, 80, 30. Excuse me, all these are in 80, 30. 80, 70 is when the destruction of the temple and all this stuff was blown up. And so that's when all these things were written is between there. So 80, 30, very, very significant. Now it always amazes me I don't know how true those are all rabbinic legends, so they're not scripture. So, you know, I, I put that out there. I, I just give it to you as a, uh, the writings are there, the history is there. It's just interesting and profound to me how these guys who knew scripture and saw all these things, and you can read, Arnold points this out, you can read all these rabbis who wrote this down, and you never yet find them asking the question of why? Why? Why did all this stuff happen in A.D. 30? They, 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 they don't ask the question. You know, if you're watching online tonight or whatever, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose again the third day, and through him, he offers a way to heaven. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. There is no hope for us apart from the finished work of Christ. Amen? Hope you know him today. Well, I hope that was fascinating stuff to you tonight. I know we got up the, on the edge a little bit. Uh, I gave you a lot to think about. Uh, any questions or comments? I didn't even get done early. Sorry, sorry Brother Mike. Um, but I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Uh, we're going to close in prayer. And then what we're going to do, uh, we, we have some tables set up in the fellowship hall. And we need, if you could hang around and help us do two things. One, help drive-in ministries, put the little stickers on their newsletters to head out. And number two, we need some tables put up for uh, the Diamond Dinner this uh, Friday. So we need a few tables set up. So if you can help us, that'd be great. Otherwise, we'd love seeing you. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live. And we'll see you all again on Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the teaching of your word tonight. Uh, Lord, it's uh, fascinating to discuss these things. You know, Lord, it's really, it's, it's hard to put into my brain. Uh, but I'm so thankful that you were willing to demonstrate that and that you demonstrate it today by thousands of years later, you've preserved your word for us, uh, telling us of these things. And we're so thankful uh, for the sacrifice of Christ, our Lord, who takes away uh, the sin of the world and through personal faith can take away our individual sin. Lord, I pray if there's one watching tonight, listening tonight that doesn't know you as their personal savior, uh, may they take that moment and turn to you as the Bible says, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust him as your sacrificial lamb. Thank you again for this time in Jesus name. Amen and amen. You could be watching us later. Whichever way, we're glad you've tuned in. Or you could be watching on our YouTube channel, Odd Baptist, capital O, capital D, capital B, Baptist, all one word. And you'll find our, uh, our YouTube page, and we, you can also watch these services on the YouTube channel. At any rate, uh, <laughs> how do you like all the YouTube channels? Go find it, hit the subscribe button and the notifications so you'll know when we have a new video that's available. <laughs> Did I do that good? Okay, I think so. Uh